Hello, this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and welcome to Lesson 37 of the Baseline 52-Week Bible Course. In this section of the course, we have been considering the nine gifts of the Spirit, some people call them the charismatic gifts, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've talked about the power gifts, We've talked about the revelatory gifts, such as discerning of spirits, the word of knowledge. And now we're going to cover what is probably uh, better known is the three gifts known as the utterance gifts of the spirit. The other utterance gifts include uh, tongues or glossolalia, interpretation, and prophecy. Now... What is prophecy? Prophecy is a tool that God uses to stir his people. It's the most important, according to the scriptures, of the utterance gifts. This is the reason that it takes the other two, tongues and interpretation, just to equal this one. When you mature in the utterance gifts, you will generally not give a message in tongues unless the Lord wants someone to interpret or <clears throat> for a sign as the scripture says in 1st Corinthians 14 22 to the unbeliever prophet and we'll cover more of that in just a moment uh, prophecy is a supernatural utterance in a known tongue the Hebrew word for prophecy means to flow forth it carries the thought of that which bubbles like a fountain, to let drop, to lift up. It's God saying, let me drop this on you. It's to lift up, to tumble forth, to spring forth. The Greek word means to speak for God, a verbal communication of the mind of God originating from divine inspiration. That's what prophecy is. It's a message from God. Now, in your known tongue. Now, and notice that it, there's nothing inherent in the definition of prophecy that is about forth, that is about foretelling. There's nothing inherent in the definition of a prophecy that's about a word of knowledge. There's a difference between word of knowledge and prophecy. Some people think that if a word of, that if a word of prophecy doesn't include information that's supernaturally revealed, that the prophecy is invalid. And therefore, they will come before a prophet and they will not say, I don't want to tell you anything about me because that would make it an invalid prophecy. you got to tell me secrets. Well, the Bible says that type of a sign is for an unbeliever. And if you're going to grow up in the gifts of God, and there are those that have been uh, moving in the gifts of the Spirit, believing in the gifts of the Spirit for many years, but they have this one immaturity. They require a word of knowledge component in a gift of prophecy. But that is for an unbeliever. The scripture says that uh, when you prophesy, the unbeliever comes in, you prophesy to him, he falls down on his face and reports that God is in you of a truth. Why? Because there was a word of knowledge component to your prophecy. But, that, but you're not an unbeliever, are you? If you're not an unbeliever, then you shouldn't require the word of knowledge component in your prophetic word. You know, Samuel judged Israel... Throughout the year, he would go to three different places, and Moses would sit and judge the people of Israel from time to time. Even Jesus, when he prophesied, did not always include a word of knowledge component in his prophecies, although many times he did. But can you imagine uh, someone coming to the prophet Samuel, and, and uh, because his prophecy did not include a word of knowledge component, it was rejected? Uh, that's just immaturity. There are, those, there are those out there, and I've heard this taught in the major prophetic schools by world known, worldwide known ministers who say if there's not a word of knowledge component in the prophecy, then it's not valid. That is not true. Again, the word of knowledge component is for an unbeliever. It's to deal with unbelief in your life. And if you're not an unbeliever, then you should be willing to receive the prophetic and have the prophetic speak into your life without the dog and pony show 
that is presented for the unbeliever to get his attention, uh, God should have your attention already. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 tells us, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. You know you're supposed to desire spiritual gifts. Uh, there's a group, there's a mainline denomination out of the holiness move back at the turn of the century in the 1900s. Uh, it's out of the Azusa Street Pentecostal outpouring came out of the holiness movement. And the holiness movement, they wanted the move of God, but they rejected tongues. But they were trying to figure out how to get along with it. So they came up with a wonderful idea that sounds spiritual, but it's actually quite carnal. It says, seek not, forbid not. We don't want to, the Bible does say, forbid not to speak with tongues, forbid not to prophesy, but they added something to it. Don't seek to do it either. Don't seek to speak in tongues. It's okay if you want to do that, but don't seek to do that. Well, that's not biblical because the scripture says desire spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues. Uh, it's, it's a spiritual gift. And the Bible says when you speak in tongues, your mind is unfruitful. It's not profited by speaking in tongues. Well, we know that. That's why the mind rejects it. Oh, that's just babbling. There's nothing to that. But yet, a couple of months back, I love to tell this story. We were in our uh, April War Room prayer event, and we pray in tongues a lot there. And an Italian believer had joined in, and I was praying in tongues. And I don't speak a word of Italian. And as I was praying in tongues, the Italian believer sent word and said, you were praying in perfect Italian, saying that will be enough of that. So do you, does it have to be in, a, in another earthly language? No, it doesn't. But the point is, is that the mind rejects tongues. The mind rejects many things that are spiritual. But you should still desire spiritual gifts. But rather that you prophesy. You know, the prophetic is, is the red-headed stepchild of uh, the church of God today. Uh, pastors, as a rule, are not real comfortable with the prophetic. People kind of raise their eyebrows about the prophetic. They're just not too sure about the prophetic. We'll call someone pastor or teacher or evangelist, but if someone is called prophet or apostle, well, we don't like that. That makes us uncomfortable. Why? Because we don't accept what they do. But we have to make up our mind, uh, is 1 Corinthians 14, is that uh, the inspired word of God? And if it's the inspired word of God, then we need to accept the prophetic. We need to teach people how to prophesy. We need to act activate people. We should be prophesying. We should be speaking in tongues. And uh, if we think prophesying and speaking in tongues is, is not valid, then you just had to make your mind up. Let's just establish the parameters, and we'll just tear those pages out of our Bibles. But I don't think anybody's prepared to do that. Now, so it says desire, and the word there means co cultivate, covet, cultivate. See, spiritual gifts don't fall on you like pennies from heaven. This is not a Hollywood movie. We're not psychics or clairvoyants. The gifts of God must be cultivated in your life. Uh, we're trying to learn Spanish, and we find that learning another language is something you have to cultivate and you become fluent. Well, you can become fluent in the gifts of the Spirit as well, but they must be cultivated. Uh, we have to demystify the prophetic, get the superstition out of it, and realize it's something that you mature in and you grow in fluency in. Uh, everyone in the church, from the youngest to the oldest, should prophesy. Uh, prophecy is just hearing the voice of God and articulating what you hear to others. Prophecy is a preeminent gift. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, He that prophesies, prophesies to men unto edification, to build you up, exhortation, to encourage you and comfort you, make you feel better after you've had a bad day or a bad life. The early church gives us a pattern for modern church life. Prophecy and the open ministry of the congregation was the rule. The teaching, that one, uh, the teaching of one man to a silent audience was actually a great exception. It's a modern uh, invention of the last 500 years. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together? When they came together, every one of you has a psalm, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, or an interpretation. Let this happen. Let all things be done in the edifying. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. So 
if that's not what we're having, then we're not having New Testament church. And he, people say, well, he was just rebuking them because they were doing that. No, there's no rebuke in that. He said, let that happen. When you come together, every one of you has something to contribute. Let that happen. Let that be done so that everybody can be built up and everyone can be edified. And if that doesn't happen, then that might be church, our definition of church, our modern invention of church life. But is it fully expressing first century church life and does it matter that that came down to us as an example the scripture is given by god it's profitable for instruction correction rebuke so that means that the new testament record is a template for us and if our church life does not fit the pattern of the new testament template that paul said was handed down to us as an example then perhaps we need to begin to coax ourselves gently uh, back toward the pattern so that we can have a New Testament church life with a New Testament people moving in the power of the Spirit, moving in the gifts of the Spirit, including prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. Now, uh, the usual contention about uh, this type of a meeting where everybody gets to share is that the meeting must be conducted decently and in order. The idea of everyone ministering in the gathering, uh, that drowns the religious mind in offense and unbelief. The objection is a perversion. They object, quoting a perversion of the following verse. 1 Corinthians 14.30, let all things be done decently and in order. <laughs> so, without a doubt, Paul's demanding that decent and orderly conduct in the gathering. But in this passage, he's actually calling for two things. He said first things. He says, first, let all things be done. Psalms, doctrines, hymns, revelations. Let everything be done, Paul is saying. Secondly, let's do it without getting in a fist fight. <laughs> let's do it without stepping on each other and, and uh, being having a confusing, strife-torn meeting. Uh, he recognized, yeah, it's like spiritual gunslinging, but guess what? The devil's usually the one who gets mowed down. Don't mow down each other. Cooperate and love each other. See, if we don't fulfill both aspects of this, if we don't do all things... Uh, decently in an order, then uh, we're holding an indecent and a disorderly meeting. <laughs> Even if all they do is three songs, take up the offering, preach 20 minutes, and go home, it's indecent and disorderly unless there is an opening, a potential, for God to use whoever he wants to, not just the paid clergyman. According to Paul, see, we have to make our mind up. Uh, do we believe that the book of 1 Corinthians, particularly chapter 14, is the inspired word of God? If we're not sure, that's okay. We'll just take that out of our Bible. But yet, if we have the integrity, if we, if we believe it's the inerrant, complete Word of God, and it's given to us for instruction, correction, and righteousness, then we, we have to think about these things. We have to be a thinking people and say, okay, we want to foster this in our midst. I want to be this kind of a person. I want to be a leader who is open to this kind of a gathering, and I want to be an attendee who's willing for God to use me in whatever small way he might choose to do so. Now, what is prophecy for? 1 Corinthians 14.3 He that prophesies, again, prophesies for edification, exhortation, and comfort, not repudiation, rebuke, and denunciation. This guy that gets up and he says, meany, meany, tuckle you farson, and tells you what a bad guy you are, uh, that's not New Testament prophecy. That's modern uh, immaturity, and I don't care what the pedigree of the so-called prophet is. You won't find that kind of prophecy in the New Testament. I challenge you to do it. You won't find it. Uh, prophecy is used as a tool of encouragement, and the, uh, the Jesus had a handful of his followers. They wanted to use it to call out fire on others. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. That's old covenant paradigm Jesus was telling them. You need, I, Jesus was in effect saying, I'm reconfiguring the prophetic. Forget calling down fire from heaven. Forget stepping on toes. Let's wash feet with the prophetic. And uh, those who, who see it otherwise, they don't understand their gift. They don't understand their calling. And perhaps they don't even have one. Uh, it's used as a tool of encouragement. It should always leave. Prophecy should always leave the church edified and lifted up. Edified and lifted up 
in hope, in motivation to face whatever challenges they may be going through. Many times this may not happen at the time of prophecy is given, but the reason for this is that there, there may be negatives, it may be a vulnerability, there may be a heaviness that comes, but yet in the fear of the Lord, the result of acting on the word will bring about edification, exhortation, comfort. Now, what is prophecy not for? Prophecy is not for doctrine, not for soapbox grandstanding, or telling everyone off with a thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, you know, I'm going to tell you just what I think of you. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that the written word, the Bible, is for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. Spoken prophecy does not hold the same weight as the written word. This is why the word commands prophecy to be judged. This is, the, this is most helpful. Did you hear, hear what I said? Prophecy. We don't judge John 3.16. John 3.16 judges us. But when prophetic utterance comes, we need to assess that. We need to judge it. Uh, this is helpful to us because it helps us determine the full extent of what God is saying in the prophecy and what our appropriate response should be. There should always be a response to a prophetic word because all prophetic words are conditional and provisional. Uh, you, know, you can get a, prophet, a prophecy that says what a wonderful future you're going to have, but if you don't examine, now listen to me, if you don't examine that word to find out what the conditions and provisions are, then it's not going to happen. Personal prophecy, corporate prophecy is not like pennies from heaven. It's not God saying, come what may, this is going to happen for you. That's not how it works. It's a weapon of war. And you can pick up a weapon and go to war, but the outcome of the battle is determined on your courage and your audacity to obey the commander. So uh, we have to develop the gift of prophecy. Someone who exercises the gifts of the Spirit, you have to allow them to develop in that gift. The first time someone prophesies, prophesies the first time someone prophesies, it may be halting and imperfect. There's a such thing as developing fluency in the spoken gifts, and all the other gifts for that matter. Uh, prophecy, or isn't it amazing that we, do you believe in healing? Oh yes, I absolutely believe in healing. What if I told you that you're, I'm the pastor of your church, and I'm announcing, uh, we don't believe in healing anymore, we're not going to have it in our church. You'd probably go to another church. Well, why would a pastor do that? Well, you know, most of the people that you lay hands on don't get healed. And there's some truth to that. A lot of people that you lay hands on don't get healed. But yet we continue to accept the viability of healing ministry. Well, somebody gives a prophecy that doesn't come to pass, and we call that person a false prophet. Well, what if, the, what if somebody lay, your pastor lays hands on you, you don't get healed, you love him for the effort. Well, he's not a false healer? It's not the devil trying to heal through him and fail? We need to give the prophetic gift, let's just grow up. We've been doing this, the prophetic gifts and the nine gifts of the Spirit have been restored to the church for over a hundred years. And we're still uh, not mature in our response. We, it's true, you, we believe in healing, we lay hands for healing. Not everybody gets healed. That's a whole other conversation. We prophesy, not all the prophecies come to pass. There's reasons for that. Don't reject the prophetic. Quit bringing the prophetic into an unfair scrutiny that we don't subject the other gifts of the Spirit to. Let's just be honest and sincere with the Scriptures. Now, prophecy is something that originates in the mind of God, and it comes to you by the Holy Spirit. However, before it can get to the people, it's got to pass through your spirit and your mind and your personality in order for you to give it voice. That's why you have to remember that the Holy Spirit is gentle. You'll take a word he gives and you'll give it hard. Uh, the Holy Spirit is also never going to force you to say or do anything against your will. It's never proper to abruptly disrupt a service with the excuse, I couldn't help myself, this was God. No, you have a choice. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, 32 says, 1 Corinthians 14.32 says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. As you yield to the inward urge or prompting to speak a phrase or a sentence out from God, you must draw that word through your own heart and mind. 
And when that prophecy passes from the Holy Spirit through your spirit to the congregation, interesting changes take place. I, you, you turn it into the King's English. That's okay if that's your style. I don't say that's wrong. But that is one of the most common effects of a prophecy. It becomes laced with Elizabethan language of the King James Bible. This points up that it's possible for a word to become garbled to an extent by attitude, experiences, spiritual uh, maturity or the lack thereof. A bad attitude or unforgiveness causes a word meant to edify to actually beat down and discourage a group. Phrases like, do you not know and have you not heard? Well, hello, here comes a garbled prophecy. Uh, other phrases like, little children, look unto me. You should watch those very carefully. They can indicate a person prophesying out of a need for attention rather than truly the Spirit's leading. Now remember that these human accents on prophetic words are a natural part of the learning process of maturing in the gifts. Don't be embarrassed or offended by giving or receiving these kinds of words. These accents, can human accents, can even at times be desirable. But we should all be ready to receive correction and guidance and strive to attain to the pure word of the Lord. Now let's read another scripture. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 39. No, you covet to win the lottery. You don't covet to prophesy, right? It's like, I got a winning lottery ticket here. Who wants one? We, we'd have a few folks lined up. Uh, but okay, who wants to prophesy? And everybody's looking around. You know, not me. No, covet to prophesy cultivate the prophetic gifts, but realize that prophecy needs to be judged. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 says, let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. Now, all prophecy should be judged and examined. The criteria is, does it line up with the word? It should be accurate to the circumstances and the situations it addresses. Its tone should be uplifting to the individual or to the group, and it should glorify the name of Jesus. It is the elder's place at times to provoke you to prophesy when you have not shown ability to share God's work with a group. Don't be intimidated by this, or by an instruction to perhaps to hold a prophecy you feel God's given you to a group or individual until a proper time. The prophetic gifts are subject to the authority in the room, uh, in the church. We, we need to be cooperative. And uh, there are times you have to violate the protocol of the house, but just be gracious about the consequences if you do that. Uh, prophecy is an exciting gift to operate in. And don't hold back another day in allowing God to use you in this powerful gift. Now, Let's talk about tongues and interpretation. God is a God who speaks. He created the worlds with his words. He communicated verbally with Adam and Eve in the dawn of creation. He spoke to Noah regarding the ark and the judgment of the world. He conversed with his men and women in all ages and dispensations. God is not quiet, shy, or introverted. He has provided many ways that we may communicate with him, primarily his word, the Bible. But he also speaks with us by his inward presence uh, in our minds, in our consciousness. Uh, further, he speaks through chosen teachers and proclaimers. But additionally, he also speaks through the gifts of utterance, including tongues, and interpretation. If you don't have this gift, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and find the teaching on overcoming hindrances to speaking in tongues. Now, what are tongues? Acts, that's what you have in your tennis shoes. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians 12, 10. Tongues are defined as spirit-inspired speaking in which the conscious mind plays no part. 
It is the speaking of a language known or angelic, unlearned by the speaker. Uh, interpretation is the God-given inspiration to speak in the known tongue, the equivalent of that which has been spoken in an unknown tongue. Uh, prayer language, prayer, praying in tongues, privately, does not require interpretation. An interpretation is not a translation. That's why you can have a lengthy tongue with a very brief interpretation. You can have a really long tongue, and I don't mean gossips in the church. You can have a very uh, uh, long message in tongues, and it comes back with the interpretation. Children, the Lord is saying, trust in me, it's going to be okay, because it's a translation, not a word-for-word -word interpretation. But these two gifts work together. Tongues and interpretation are two sides of the same coin. Paul could not conceive of one without the other. These two gifts are together become, in the corporate setting become the equivalent of prophecy. When a tongue is given, it is proper to expect, I'm talking about not privately, but openly, it's proper to expect an interpretation. A tongue addresses public, addressed publicly before a group should be interpreted. Now, commonly the teaching is that there are different kind, kinds of tongues, but that's not necessarily held up in Scripture. There is one gift of tongues for many purposes. Tongues, the one gift used in prayer, the one gift used individually, the one gift used with a group. But it's one gift because we, we tend to take it and we, we say, well, there's intercessory tongues, there's, there's uh, personal prayer language tongues, there's the tongues you receive when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and the tongues that are given in the corporate group. I've heard it taught that way for years, that it's five different uh, gifts. It's not. It's one gift, differences of administrations, like we talked about in the first part of this section of the course. Um, any of them may be interpreted. You can interpret your private tongue if you just want to do that, and you might hear some amazing things. The benefit of tongues and interpretation. Tongues and interpretation facilitate praise to God. Uh, they operate in prayer and have the same purpose as prophecy in public meetings. Jude 20 says that tongues build you up in your faith and your spiritual character. Tongues are an excellent way of giving thanks, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 17. Uh, they can also be used by God to win the unbeliever as well. And so, uh, where do we begin with these utterance gifts? How do you get started? Well, tongues were the baseline gift. They were the first gift given, Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, to inaugurate the early church into the powerful dynamics of the operation of the nine gifts of the Spirit that we've been covering in this section of the course. Tongues are not to be fretted over. You don't need to break out in hives over tongues. As a born-again believer, Guess what? You're born again. You can speak in tongues whether you know it or not. The first time you open to the Lord in this area, it can be a fantastic experience. Or it can be a very quiet experience depending on you uh, and the Lord. A good beginning is to have quiet times in prayer before God as they did in Acts 2, 1-4. through They waited and they got quiet. During this time there were utterances presented to their minds that they then verbalized. This yielding to the Spirit brought on a tremendous emotional release and a deep sense of rapture. There were also uh, spontaneous outbursts, and there were also signs and wonders and earthquakes near them, near the room where they were praying. So the experience may be very quiet for you, but, the, but it, it may be very loud. The important thing is just to wait on God and take the utterance that comes to you. He'll give you the utterance, you have to speak it comes to you as a gift from God, and then take that capacity and exercise it at will when you are in need of strength or prompted by the Spirit to do so. So I encourage you, listen, we take little babies. You're born again. You're born the first time. Mom and Daddy couldn't wait for you to start talking. They were really happy and competing over would they say Mommy or Daddy first. And we just thrilled to get our little little ones, we held them on our lap, we'd get them to say words after us. And we just giggled and were totally elated. We were giddy when we could get our little ones to sit on our lap, look in our face, and say things after us. Well, you're born again now. You have the capacity of speech. Some people, preachers, have made a big deal about disqualifying those who were led by others to speak in tongues. That's not wrong. You're a spiritual baby. 
and if someone knows have, has the capacity of spiritual speech, it's okay to pray after them. I've seen many people uh, transition into their own gift by learning to speak in tongues after others. And your mind won't like it. And, your, and to the degree your mind is in control, it will offend your spirit every time. Oh, they don't sound like God. Well, it's because you are a mental Christian, uh, not a spiritual Christian. You need to tell your mind to sit down and shut up and give your spirit a little bit of control and access to your speech center. And say, Pasta da basoto borobo se pikishta borobo satikama. I know you can do it. Sita baraba kasta borobo sitishkabata borobo sete basta robo kotishta masata. And then you do it some more. And you do it some more. And all of a sudden, there's going to be your words originating in your spirit in power. And your faith will be built up. And you'll be launched into a new and exciting dimension of your walk with God. I've had a lot of fun bringing this lesson to you. Next week, we'll begin talking about another aspect of the gifts. We've talked about office gifts, the nine gifts of the spirit, the fivefold ministry, the nine gifts of the spirit. Next week, we're going to start talking about something that's not quite as well known, the motivational gifts. God's personality templates that he drops on believers to help them find their place in the body of Christ. God bless you. If you'd like to have this teaching, the book, Fit All 52 Lessons, I encourage you. It can be found in, at uh, fathersheartmedia.com. It's available in PDF, download format, or in paperback. God bless.